my name is Nicholas Rose. Um, I'm a professor of sociology at King's College London uh, and head of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. Uh, in the Human Brain Project, I'm part of the so Social and Ethical Division of the Human Brain Project, and I head up the Foresight Lab that's based here at King's College. Uh, and I want to talk today about responsible research and innovation and its implications for the Human Brain Project. So let's start with the question of social responsibility in science, or to put that more bluntly, the social responsibility that scientific researchers might have for the implications of their work. Why should scientific researchers take responsibility for the implications of their research? Or how could they, even if they wanted to, take responsibility for the implications of their research? Now, often the response here is to say, well, surely science is and science should be morally neutral. While it might have ethical and social implications, those are for society to deal with, they're not for the researchers to deal with. And even those who think that in principle it might be a good idea for the researchers to, quote, take responsibility for those implications, could those researchers, especially those working at a rather basic level, predict those implications, because surely in order to take responsibility, they'd have to have an idea of what those implications might be. And there are many conventional responses to that demand to take responsibility. One of them is to say, well, actually, it's extremely difficult to predict the implication of uh, technological advances. Who could predict the implications of the computer. It's widely uh, uh, stated that at the very beginnings of uh, computer science, when the first computer was developed, uh, there was a prediction that about five of those would be sold worldwide. Well, of course, we know that prediction was very wide of the mark. Or the internet. Who could predict at the very beginnings of the internet or the World Wide Web that perhaps two of the most fundamental and perhaps troubling implications might be online gambling and online pornography? Could the inventors of the technology that made the internet possible, quote, take responsibility for those implications? Or the mobile phone? Who could predict that amongst the many good implications of the mobile phone would be a transformation of, te of trading relations in Africa, where there are no landlines, and where it's now possible for people who are selling their goods to phone up and find out how much those goods are fetching at markets 100 miles away? or the bad consequences of the mobile phone, which we see all around us, where everybody is glued to those phones uh, 23 and a half hours a day. So social scientists and futurologists have been consistently wrong in their predictions about technology. Why then should scientific researchers be asked to take responsibility? Well, of course, that question isn't new, and um, perhaps it was raised first in its modern form in relation to the Manhattan Project and the development of the atom bomb. This quote uh, by Robert Oppenheim uh, is uh, well known uh, after the uh, results of the explosions of the atomic bombs were known to him. He quotes from the uh, famous uh, Bhagavita, uh, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. And in that post-atom bomb world, scientists began once more to consider the responsibilities that had fallen on them, whether they chose those responsibilities or not. And indeed, Oppenheimer himself gave several speeches where he argued that at some moment, it was crucial for scientists to step out of their role as, as morally neutral scientific researchers to engage with discussions about the implications of their work. A little bit closer to home, when some of the implications of the first kinds of genomic research around recombinant DNA became known, and when people were very concerned, scientists themselves very concerned about the potential implications of recombinant DNA and its release from the laboratories, there was a famous uh, conference at a cinema, a conference organized by scientists and for scientists about how the consequences of recombinant DNA should be dealt with. 
It led to a declaration, the famous Asilomar Declaration, and it was a meeting of scientists themselves who took professional responsibility to try and regulate the implications of this new technology. Now, we're away from Asilomar, quite, many, quite a number of years away from Asilomar, and perhaps the issues that Asilomar and even the issues that the Manhattan Project or the Apollo Project put on the agenda are even more pertinent to us today. Because 60 years of social science research on science and scientific research has shown us that science is not outside the real world. It is social and socially embedded in very many senses. From laboratory life onwards, scientific research is a social affair the priority disputes in science, the struggle for professional recognition, the demand that scientists are concerned about intellectual property in their discoveries, the battles that there are for grants, and so on. And in particular, in the world in which we live, the demand uh, from the funders of science that their, their funding of scientific research should have impacts. It should develop applications. It should translate into uh, things that were of benefit for individuals, for communities, and for economies in the real world. And this is especially the case for large international and well-funded interdisciplinary scientific projects, like, for instance, the Human Brain Project, projects with a high profile that promise major social and economic benefits. So science, politics, and commerce are intertwined in many contemporary, especially big science projects, in the quest for, quote, translation of scientific results in the lab to outputs and impact and products that will increase health, wealth, and the competitive advantage of their economies. And this is even more so in biotechnology and biomedicine and now in computing, robotics and artificial intelligence. And of course those hopes in biomedicine, in biotechnology, in artificial intelligence and robotics, those hopes of translation go hand in hand with a whole set of fears about the consequences of translation. And I suppose we see these uh, uh, publicized every day in relation to the consequences of artificial intelligence on the one hand and of robotics and indeed of uh, intelligent robots uh, which we see both in fiction and in fact in our, uh, in our living rooms every evening. So the new scientific life, if I can use that phrase, the new scientific life is one where it's very difficult for scientists to say we are morally neutral, we have no responsibility for the implications of our work, because the demand is that their work does have public benefit, does have implications, and the demand is that we have some debates over what those implications might be. And the question is, can scientists, can scientific researchers stand outside those debates, or should they be involved in them, and if so, in which way? Now, as, as I've said, uh, increasingly uh, research funders are arguing that there should be a quid pro quo for their research, especially if they're giving large amounts of funds, as one sees in the Big Brain Project. And those quid pro quos should be that that research meets societal challenges. This idea that there are grand social challenges, and these grand social challenges are ones that can only be addressed by scientific research, by scientific development, and by the implications of that being taken through into products and uh, technologies used for social benefit. And uh, what I've shown you on the screen is how these are represented in the current uh, European Commission funding Project Horizon 2020, and you'll see there a list of the grand societal challenges that research is being funded to address. Health, demographic change and well-being, flood security, uh, secure energy supplies, smart uh, transport, uh, how Europe can organize itself in a changing world, and how we can secure our societies, 
you can see those. And in different ways, many uh, of the funding agencies frame their funding in those kinds of terms, in terms of those challenges, and actually those challenges are often quite similar between different funding agencies. So how can or how could scientific researchers themselves be involved in those debates? We can see historically, just taking the last 30 or 40 years, that there have been a number of attempts to enhance scientific responsibility and engage science and society more directly. I've already mentioned the uh, debates at Asilomar. Uh, at Asilomar in 1975, it was scientists themselves who debated the best approach to regulating recombinant DNA. It was scientists themselves who considered that they were best placed to understand the potential benefits and indeed the potential dangers, and that they themselves were best placed through pre their professional responsibility for managing those dangers. Well, I suppose now we would probably say that approach, leave it to us, we're the scientists, we're the experts, uh, leave it to the professionals, is insufficient. It's no longer sufficient to satisfy those who feel that the experts themselves have interests in these developments and can't be thought of as having the best, uh, being in the best position to understand and to regulate them. Following on from that, there was a significant move over 20 or 30 years to enhance, quotes, the public understanding of science. That was based on the idea that it was a very good idea in principle for citizens in democratic societies to engage with debates about what were the proper directions of scientific research. But the unfortunate thing was that most citizens did not have the scientific literacy to enable them to engage in those debates in an informed way. There was a kind of deficit model here that we couldn't really think of ordinary everyday citizens as having the capacity to evaluate these extremely difficult questions of risk and benefit and management and regulation and so on and so forth. But actually that attempt to enhance the public understanding of citizens, to enable them to engage in scientific, in debates about the direction of science, was by and large rather ineffective. And indeed, probably that deficit model, oh, citizens lack knowledge, we need to give them knowledge, just giving citizens knowledge and giving them reassurance that if they have the knowledge, they will feel okay, that everybody is looking out for their best interests, that that was not the best answer to this question. And as we know in Europe, a number of scandals around scientific, uh, around the implications of, uh, of uh, scientific developments uh, uh, caused major concern. There was the concern about uh, uh, blood transfusion in France. There was the concern about bovine spongiform encephalitis in the UK. Uh, a number of other quote, scandals led to the perception that actually there was a very low level of trust from the public in science. A third kind of answer uh, was particularly associated with the big science project of the Human Genome Project, uh, the so-called ELSI answer, ethical, legal, and social implications. Now, the Human Genome Project, as I'm sure everybody knows here, was a massively funded and highly distributed project amongst many different labs. Um, but quite early on, I believe in a press conference that uh, James Watson had, when he was asked, doesn't the Human Genome Project raise a number of ethical, legal, and social implications, and how are those going to be dealt with? He undertook that a certain percentage of the funding for the HGP should indeed be directed towards this LC kind of research, an LC or LSER, ethical, legal, and scientific uh, and social aspects. Those acronyms became very widespread in a whole uh, slew of research that was being done about the implications of research in genomics, the implications of research in reproductive technology, the implications of research in nanotechnology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Quite a bit of that research was done, 
there are debates about how high quality that research is, but they are really for the social scientists to argue about amongst themselves. Perhaps the main problem with that research was that it didn't impact at all upon the development of the projects themselves. The Human Genome Project went on in the direction that it went, driven by the scientists and the directors of the project and perhaps by the research findings itself. And as we know now, multiple, multiple genomes have been, uh, have been sequenced. The cost of sequencing has gone down and down and down. The sequences are available uh, on the internet uh, with implications that probably weren't even plausibly uh, available to us at the beginning of the Human Genome Project, since the HGP showed us that most of the things we thought we knew about the human genome were quite wrong. And it's certainly not very clear that any of that social research that was done on those ethical, legal, and social implications had major consequences or even really significant consequences for the development of the research or the way in which it was uh, taken out, translated into science. The fourth principal way, partly as a result of concerns about those other three ways has been something which stresses much more, not so much public understanding, not work on implications, but actually that publics, because of course there are many different publics, and this idea that there's one single public with one particular view is, uh, is far from the truth, that publics, that's persons, persons like you and me in our everyday work, should be engaged with science. We should have debates with scientists. There should be open science and open debates and open engagement. And that idea that there should be public engagement with science is certainly one element of the term that has now come to the fore in thinking about these matters, which is responsible research and innovation. So I want to say a little bit about this phrase, responsible research and innovation. And again, if you go to the Horizon 2020 website of the European Commission, uh, you will see that the European Commission has adopted this phrase, responsible research and innovation, and adopted a commitment that all the research that it funds should be done under the aegis of responsible research and innovation. And if you go to uh, the UK, for example, our Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in the UK also has articulated that principle that all research that the EPSRC funds should be done within the framework of responsible innovation. And I'm going to say a little bit about what they mean by responsible innovation. And actually, there are some differences between the way in which this is framed, for instance, by the uh, British Research Council, the EPSRC, and the way in which it's framed by the European Commission. I'm going to say a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. Uh, but first, let's just pause to think about some of the difficulties. Again, think again about some of the difficulties that beset those who try to be responsible about the consequences of their research and development for innovation and transformation in society. How is it possible to assure oneself, to assure one's funders, and to ensure the publics who might be in interested in this question that the benefits which are promised can be achieved and that the harms around which people worry can be minimized? Now, there's a little saying, often attributed to uh, Niels Bohr, uh, but no one knows if Niels Bohr actually said this, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. In hindsight, it, it may sound paradoxical, but in hindsight, it is relatively easy to understand how certain things have come about. In hindsight, it's probably easy to understand how internet gambling has been one of the main consequences of the internet. Uh, and to think, yes, of course, now we realize that mobile phones enable people to communicate it along, across long distances in areas where there are no landlines and what are going to be the implications of that. But believe me, those were not the things that were being thought of when people were trying to predict the implications of these uh, of these new developments. 
the future is always uncertain and the implications of technological developments usually escape predictions. So that's the problem number one. Problem number two is what's often called the Collingridge uh, uh, dilemma, named after David Collingridge, who in 1980 first put this, uh, this paradox forward, the so-called dilemma of control. What's the dilemma of control? Well, Collingridge said, and I think he's right in most circumstances, that in the early stages of development of a technology, you can make changes about the path along which it's going to develop. You can control how the technology works. You probably could have controlled the mobile phone. You could have thought more about uh, what the World Wide Web might look like and try and transform that building security, etc., etc., right at the very beginning. But it was very hard at the beginning to predict what the implications might be. But later on, when we begin to see the implications, it's almost impossible to do anything about them because they have become so deeply embedded in society, so deeply embedded in everyday practice, if you take things like the mobile phone, that to, to roll that back, to roll social media back, to roll Google and Facebook and Twitter and all the rest of them back, now, sorry, it's impossible to do that. So when you see the consequences, it's very hard to intervene. That's what's called lock-in in the jargon of those who think about those kinds of questions. Thirdly, it's very difficult now for people to say, well, I am just a basic researcher. Because I've already pointed out that in the major funding for some of these projects, basic research, technological development, and innovation policy are very closely intertwined. Hopes and visions for the beneficial implications of the technology are right there at the very beginning. They have to be there because you won't get the funding for the projects in the first place if you don't make those claims. So they're articulated and embodied very early in the research process, the idea that this might have useful implications is embodied right there at the very beginning. And it's quite difficult, therefore, for the researchers that are working on projects that are funded because of these hopes, it's quite difficult, therefore, for the researchers to say, well, my project might have been funded because of all these big promises about its impact, uh, but actually uh, I don't think I have any uh, potential say in what that impact might be. But as I've said, the translational pathways from research to their implications are ex far from linear, and I'll say a little bit about that at, uh, in, uh, uh, later on in this, in this talk. So we have a kind of paradox here. It's difficult to predict the future. Uh, once things have developed, it's hard to control them. And yet dreams and hopes and promises about the future are built right in to the beginnings of the research, even though we can't very easily say how that research is going to go out into society. And part of the reason why we can't predict so easily how that research is going out into society is because the past is not a very reliable guide to the future. If you look at something like the mobile phone, that is a disruptive innovation. That is to say, it's, dis it's disrupted and transformed a whole path of development. The move from wired to wirelessness, the availability of these phones everywhere you go across the world has completely transformed many, many aspects of life that were not understandable in terms of just a prediction of the, the linear development of the older uh, technologies. The uses of these devices weren't, weren't dreamed of by those who created them. And we've seen, as I've already mentioned, many unexpected and sometimes undesirable uh, consequences. So these disruptive technologies, which radically transform the move, say, from the, uh, the landline telephone to the mobile phone. We don't even call them mobile phones now. We, those devices that we carry around, that everybody carries around, could not have easily been predicted by simply extrapolating further forward from what we've known about wired technologies. How 
then do we begin to address those sorts of questions? Well, that's what the demand for responsible research and innovation uh, places in front of us. The argument that we need to move beyond a sort of retrospective responsibility. It's no good saying to people 20 years down the line, look what's happened as a result of your technology. Why don't you take responsibility for that? Because, as I've already said, at the time when those things were developed, the time when the microchips were developed, the time when the computers were developed and so on, the creators, the developers, could not have foreseen the outcome. I've already said that there were in Asilomar attempts for professionals themselves to take responsibility. But professional uh, responsibility is not enough. Codes of conduct are very important. Codes of conduct may manage uh, how you act in your laboratory, but they can't say anything really about how you uh, can be responsible for those products when they get outside of your laboratory. Of course, we know that scientific research is enwrapped in regulatory requirements, in legislation and so on, especially in bioscience and biotechnology, about risks, about safety. Simple evaluations of risks and benefits, though, don't really help us understand the kinds of disruptive technologies uh, that we've been talking about now. And nor can we really just say, well, it's for the market to decide. Okay, so this is what happened to the mobile phone. That's because it was a market development and consumers bought it. And so that's really what led to it. And it really is the market that determines how things pan out and not for us. It's important to stress here that if one's talking about responsibility, it implies the other side, irresponsibility. But when one's talking about the lack of responsibility for these developments, it's not a lack in the individual researchers. It's not the individual researchers who are in some way or other acting irresponsibly. It's because of the way in which the system develops, the way in which the technology develops, the way in which the policies pull those things through into, uh, uh, into social translational uh, pathways. It's because the system itself does not encourage foresight and does not encourage precaution and does not encourage a debate about the social and ethical principles at a very early stage. All right, so having said all the difficulties, what then are some of the ways forward? Responsible research and innovation has been much discussed. And one often finds in the discussion some very high level and noble sounding principles. So, uh, for instance, this is a quote from uh, Jack Stilgo and colleagues in 2013 talking, this is one of the classic quotes, talking about responsible research and innovation. Quote, responsible innovation means taking care of the future through collective stewardship of science and innovation in the present. Collective stewardship of science and innovation in the present. It sounds very good, but how is it to be achieved? They go on to say, ensuring that responsible choices can be made in the future through anticipating and gaining knowledge of possible consequences and building the capacity to respond to them. Not saying what the actual consequences are going to be, because as I've said, those are very difficult to predict or to forecast, but beginning to think through what the potential consequences might be and building in the capacity to be flexible in responding to them. So trying to build that kind of responsibility, that kind of concern, that kind of debate into the innovation process itself, opening up the innovation process to discussion about these issues at a very early stage, opening up the actors, in particular the scientific researchers, to engagement with the public at a very early stage. And we know we've seen many examples of this in citizens' juries and in public debates and in scientists going into big meetings and explaining what they're doing and why they're doing it and what the implications are. 
A lot of this in relation to the work that Stilgo and colleagues did uh, was done in relation to a technology of synthetic biology, which was funded largely by the Engineering and Physical Research Council that I mentioned earlier. And it was in relation to the potential consequences of synthetic biology, which to some extent go back to Asilomar, that some of those uh, some of these issues were most widely debated, at least in the United Kingdom where I am. Bringing more actors into the decision-making process. What happens if you bring actors into the decision-making process? Well, I think there is a certain anxiety about opening up the debate to members of the public. But actually, if you look at what members of the public have asked when there have been public dialogues in science and technology, the questions that they asked are really quite straightforward and they're rather important. This again is from the work of still going colleagues. Uh, what are the kinds of questions? Product questions, process questions, and purpose questions. How will the risks and benefits be distributed? What are the other impacts that you might anticipate apart from the ones that you want? How might these change in the future? What is, that you, what is it that you don't know? What, is, what are those unknown unknowns that you don't actually know? So what are the levels of unknown consequences that may arise but that we won't know about until, uh, until they do? Because of course, all developments carry risks. All developments have unanticipated consequences, but let's be straightforward about what we know and what we don't know. Then there are a series of process questions. Are there standards? Is there, are there risk analyses? Are there regimes of governance? Who is in control of this process? And who's going to take responsibility if things go wrong? Because we know that if there aren't clear systems of accountability, then everybody can say, to put it crudely, oh, not my responsibility, oh, it was that over there, it was them over there that ought to be doing it. And you see this responsibility bounced around and nobody is held accountable. And the last question, how will we know, how do we know that we are right about claiming that our research, that our technology development will produce those benefits that we hope for. And then there are some basic purpose questions. Why are you doing this? What are your motivations in doing this? Who do you think is going to benefit? Who is going to gain? And are there alternatives? If you take this example of synthetic biology that's often promised to produce new products by, by uh, complex forms of genetic engineering and genetic manipulation, it's, I think, legitimate for uh, members of the public to say, well, okay, this is one way of producing new drugs, or this is one way of producing more economical transport systems, or this is one way of producing better fuel systems, but are there other ways which are cheaper, safer, more reliable, or is your way cheaper, safer, and more reliable, and therefore something which we really should invest in, rather than investing in something else. Now, I mentioned uh, the EPSRC, and it's produced a very simple framework, at least simple to specify, about how responsible research and innovation might be done, the so-called AREA framework. Anticipate, reflect, engage, and act. Anticipate, to explore both intended and unintended impact, social, economic, environmental. Reflect, try and think about why you're doing it, who's doing it, what are the implications, what are the uncertainties, what are the areas of ignorance, what don't we know, what do we assume but we've never really articulated and debated. Those questions that the public's asked in the second slide. Engage open these up to dialogue right from the very beginning, begin to talk to those people who have a, have a claim to be involved because you're claiming that the research that you're doing is going to be for their benefit. Be inclusive about that and then act because it's one thing to debate, it's one thing to engage, it's one thing to do all those kinds of things. Uh, but if you don't actually take any action as a result of everything that you hear, then the process itself is a little bit a little bit vacuous. So the implication here is that 
you shouldn't just look at the implications. You should do what's called upstream engagement. The researchers should be involved in these kinds of questions right at the very beginning. You should anticipate what's often called anticipatory governance. You should think through what the implications might be and try to see what kinds of regulatory strategies might be involved. You should have the opportunity at various moments in the development of the process to begin to change it, midstream modulation. You shouldn't just believe that everything is uh, established right from the very beginning. Uh, you should try and exercise foresight, which is different from forecasting. It's trying to think about all the range of possible implications and developments there might be. Some are likely, some are unlikely, some are very, very unlikely. But let's try and put them all on the table and let's try and think through, now, what would happen if? What would happen if this development happened? What would happen if we had a humanized robot that did have intelligence more or less like a human being? And of course we see these anticipations and scenarios widely thought through in fiction, in all the movies and TV programs and so on and so forth. But let's think through if that was to be the case, how would we, how would those in, with responsibility, how would they seek to respond to those kinds of developments? Or is there nothing that they can do? The claim there's nothing we can do, I think, has uh, ceased to be a very convincing one. You need to open up the process to the stakeholders, and of course the principal stakeholders are the publics. You need to think not just about the options, what are the options for synthetic biology, what are the options for neuroscience, but the way in which the issues are themselves framed. So to take an example, we shouldn't just think, now how can we make cars more energy efficient, but we should perhaps think about what's the best way of developing a transportation system for a highly complex, dense urban environment like we have in mega cities like Mumbai or Shanghai or Sao Paulo or Beijing, uh, completely paralyzed by ring road after ring road after ring road stuffed with cars, all with one person in them. Don't make your cars more energy efficient, don't make your cars less polluting, but try and think about how you might redesign the whole system itself. Now, in some ways, the innovation side, which I haven't really talked about today, is, is a bit more uh, easy to think about than the research side, because when one is in actually the innovation side in the market, in the market itself, one is forced to think about the consumers. And indeed, companies, commercial companies, know this all the time, they have to engage with the wishes, the aspirations and concerns of their customers, be sensitive to their issues, they're continually adjusting products to demands. Can one bring that back to the, to the, uh, to the lab itself? Can one bring back the concerns of the end users to the lab itself? That is the challenge of responsible research and innovation. Don't write off the concerns of those publics as ignorance, prejudice, or stupidity. Engage with them, recognize those publics are as intelligent human beings, as legitimate citizens as you, the researchers are, and you indeed are the publics for other kinds of technological developments where you're not the experts, and begin to engage with them for, from the beginning. I've outlined some of the uh, approaches that have been developed in re relation to responsible research and innovation under the AREA rubric that was uh, uh, promoted largely in the United Kingdom by our research councils. The European Commission itself, as I said, has uh, included the necessity for RRI, Responsible Research and Innovation, uh, in its funding programs for Horizon 2020. And although there are some similarities and overlaps between the European Commission's view and the one that I've tried to outline here, there are also some differences. So the European Commission stresses openness, as I have done. It stresses gender equality, which I haven't 
mentioned, uh, and a number of other key issues. And I think probably the best way to illustrate those key issues is just to show you a little movie uh, that the EC has produced and put onto their website about their approach to responsible research and innovation. We are taking care of everybody, not just us, but our environment and the people who come after us. It is also important to think about research and innovation because it's shaping so much our life. Responsible research and innovation is the European Union's approach for good governance in research and innovation. This means respecting the highest ethical values and teaching everyone about science and research. Research results should be accessible for everyone so citizens can make their voices heard and engage in research. Responsible research and innovation ensures equal participation of women and men and integrates the gender dimension into the content of research and innovation. Coping with the challenges ahead is not an easy task. We want sustainability and safety. We want privacy and security. We want economic growth and sustainability. We want all of those things at the same time. Such high standards are already leaving their mark on how people invest their money. We need business to engage. Socially responsible investing is one of the biggest changes the investment industry faces today. It's crucial we answer the question how we can deliver positive impact in the real economy. But responsible investment in research and innovation is not enough. We need all societal actors to engage. Of course, it will change the functioning and probably also the way of understanding problems and of discussing problems. If we want to go towards a knowledge society, this is what it is about. Use the knowledge that is widely uh, there in society and not only restrain us to scientific knowledge. To make responsible research and innovation a true success, we need citizens to engage. I think we need to pool everyone's resources together. I think the more people have access to the data, the more ideas will come out of it and the, the better results we will get in the end. In order to achieve such transparency and accessibility, we need researchers to engage. We will have a new opportunity to um, get researchers and civil society organizations, researchers and citizens, policy makers and educators into the boat and cooperate together. Participatory and community-based research creates innovative solutions that are adapted to real problems on the ground. We need policymakers to engage as well, to create the right conditions that make responsible research and innovation a reality. De façon politique, avec des instruments politiques, il convient de mettre en place un cadre de gouvernance européen approprié pour que la société européenne ait les moyens d'inventer son propre avenir d'une manière responsable. President Juncker once said that the time has come for a new approach and responsible research and innovation should in its very definition get everyone involved. We as policymakers and governments must make efforts to engage far more than the usual suspects in our outreach. Responsible research and innovation. It's a mindset. It is an attitude. Only if you contribute, if you get genuinely engaged in responsible research and innovation, will it catch on for good. So you can see that there are many similarities between the way in which this issue is framed by the European Commission and the kind of approach to responsible research and innovation that I've outlined here. One of the key things that is implicit in, in what the Commission said and also implicit in what I've said is that if you actually want to achieve the benefits that you set out to achieve, it's important to bring in the end users very, very early on in the process, to bring in those people who are going to actually use your innovations in the real world, 
whether it's the businesses that are going to use the technological developments or whether it's the commercial companies that are going to use them as part of a complex production process or whether it's the consumers, uh, the, the publics, who are actually going to have to purchase or live with those devices that you're going to produce. To open up, to engage, is not as threatening as many people uh, feel. It's not as disruptive as many people feel. The publics are not as hostile to technological innovation and scientific advance as often is uh, suggested, nor are they as ignorant as we know from the many, many uh, groups that form, especially around biomedical innovations, around drugs policy, around uh, 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 research into particular illnesses and so on, those end users, those people who might be patients or families of patients, are knowledgeable, are concerned, and have often a better understanding of how a disease in this particular case is experienced and managed in the real world than the researchers in the lab. A technological innovation that's going to be used in a low resource country uh, in uh, Malawi or in Kenya, uh, away from the main cities, it's uh, important right from the very beginning to engage the people who live in work and, and have to manage in those circumstances to see how that technology might be used, adapted and transformed from them. In general then, I think the message of responsible research and innovation is that where research and innovation is publicly funded, especially where it seeks to address grand social challenges, there's an obligation on everybody involved to try and shape those emerging technologies to achieve public benefit on the one hand and to seek to anticipate potential harms and mitigate them, avoid them on the other hand. What responsible research and innovation tries to do through things like foresight, through things like expert uh, consultations, through things like stakeholder involvement and engagement is to build an evidence-based consideration of those possible futures back into the innovation pathway itself across the lifespan. Not to predict and to say, well, we know what's going to happen, because the lesson of history is that we don't know what to happen. Not to direct the innovation process from the outside, what are these social science researchers, policy makers, and so on? Can they direct the innovation process and the research of scientists? No, they can't. But what they can do is help build capacity amongst the researchers and all those people in the research, development, and innovation chain to build capacity to reflect on potential consequences and try and think those through and try and seek to uh, moderate and modulate the uh, research and development trajectory in the light of that understanding. It's an inherently participatory process and of course it's going to be full of clashes of values and clashes of beliefs and clashes of, uh, of uh, views about what are desirable outcomes. We see this for instance in relation to robotics you know, what's good, what's bad, should human labor be replaced by robots, what might the implications be, what are humanized robots going to be doing if they're taking over caring responsibilities in the family, can they actually manage an, an increasingly elderly population, or are they going to simply reduce our own care, the care of one human to another, and so on and so forth. Of course there are going to be those debates, and we should welcome those debates, because if the results of the research are in intended for the real world, then the real world is the test bed and it needs to be let into the process. So the aim of all this is not to hamper science and innovation, but actually to make these research-based innovations more robust in the real world. It's a challenge. We're beginning to understand how it might work in relation to research. We're less clear about how responsible research and innovation might happen within innovation pathways themselves. There's been less work done on that, uh, and that's certainly a question uh, which needs to be addressed. 
how one can embody RRI in industry, in commerce, driven by other kinds of concerns than those concerns, driven by concerns about market and value and so on and so forth. But it is important that that happens. It is possible. It is possible to build these things into the research and development pathway, and that at least is what this little phrase, responsible research and innovation, tries to encourage. Thank you for your attention.